I've asked Charlie to teach our Sunday school class this morning. Well, actually, I did something kind of sneaky. I asked Devin to teach our Sunday school class this morning, and I asked Charlie to teach as a backup. And uh, so Devin is almost ready, but uh, he's, he's going to finish out our series on uh, living on, or he's going to actually finish our series that we were uh, in on maximizing your Christian life or living for Jesus. We had begun looking at Hezekiah and his life, and he was told that his sickness was unto death. He was going to die. He was not going to live. And he was told to set his house in order. And so uh, then last week we looked at uh, the rewards of a Christian, and we looked at how to, how to keep your life from being worthless. So many times we live and we have ideas that we are basically living our life and telling God what life should be all about. And 1 Corinthians 3 says that the works that we do are going to be gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. And uh, we looked at the word manifest last week. And the importance of that word, you know, when you get a package and it has a manifest on it, it tells you what's in it. And as far as our Christian life goes, living for the Lord Jesus, God wants to reward us. And there's a manifest in our life, what we've produced, what we've done for Jesus Christ. Many times, though, many times we want to tell God, God, this is what I'm doing for you, when God tells us what He wants us to do. And so we were looking at knowing what's gold, silver, precious stones. And uh, then we're going to end that series next week with Devin teaching on crowns, the five crowns that a believer can have. And I think that's a good study. It's one that he studied for and has taught in the past, but he's a little nervous to do this morning. And so we'll have Charlie do uh, Sunday school class this morning. Uh, one last thing, though, before I turn it over to Charlie. Did anyone do your project? Anybody do your project? Our project was to map out the last 24 hours. If you were told you had 24 hours to live, to map out how would you would spend that last 24 hours. Nobody's done that yet? Well, I hope you all don't die soon. <laughs> You're not ready. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I've done mine, but I'm not going to share it with you until you've done yours. So, Charlie, why don't you come on ahead? Hey, good morning. Good morning. Uh, open to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. All right. Um, I didn't know that actually Devin was teaching you. I didn't tell you on purpose. Um, I would have let him finish out, honestly. I'm <laughs> um, actually going to be doing what will be probably five, six week series. So start today with introduction and then Devin, I guess, will finish out his next week and then after that we'll continue on with what we're looking at. But um, we're looking at actually the subject of revival. So um, it's kind of a broad subject, uh, but we're going to narrowly focus. Um, I'm going to use as um, kind of a good uh, reference material this book by an evangelist by the name of John Van Gelderen. Uh, that he wrote. It's actually something that I had in manuscript form like years previous to its publishing from a series of messages that he had preached. And basically what he took is he took a series of messages on that subject that he narrowly focused and then made it into like basically uh, a book. Um, but that, uh, well, we're going to be introducing the subject today. So uh, James chapter 4, uh, we'll just begin at the first verse but we're going to be focusing on pretty much verse 8. So, um, okay, verse chap, uh, James 4, 1. Okay, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your own lusts uh, that warn your members? Ye lust and ye have not. Ye kill and ye desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. And then ye ask and ye receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Uh, do you think that the scripture and saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Uh, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Then draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. 
well, I guess we can go down to verse 10. Be afflicted and mourn. Weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of God and he shall lift you up. Alright, so. Revival. I know um, if you guys have been in any kind of like uh, conservative type church or fundamental type church, you've probably heard that. And then probably even for any length of time have maybe been in what would be like a series of meetings, generally, you know, like three day long or maybe even five day long, even a little bit longer than that, where they were uh, specifically assigned as being, okay, these are revival meetings. Uh, I remember the first time, uh, it wasn't long after I got saved at my home church out there in Hawaii, and like I didn't, <laughs> I, I wasn't familiar with Christian jargon. Like, I, I wasn't, you know, up on the lingo, I guess you could say, but I remember, like, everybody was like, oh, yeah, we're going to have revival. Okay, cool, what's that? What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. And then, um, again, not knocking it. I'm, it's not that you shouldn't use the, the lingo or the jargon, but just, I guess, I would say be more specific or clear whenever you communicate with people, especially they're <laughs> not as biblically literate uh, as I was at that time. But uh, then you have... Um, usually an expectation or an anticipation of, okay, God doing something. Um, which we should, because God wants to work and he's active and he's alive. Um, but a lot of times we end up kind of like, okay, it's great, we had this series of special meetings and then we are all tired out at the end of it and then we go back to what, I guess, what our normal lives are, right? Um, and it seems like, okay, it's a, it's a great time. It's a spiritual high, in a sense. Uh, it's more than just a pep rally, more than just like an emotional stirring, but it was actually, okay, God led us to do some decisions, and then we, it feels like, okay, we just kind of like flounder back to whatever, whatever we were. So we want to look at the subject uh, in part because we are going to have a week of special meetings and a number of things that are going to be going on this coming month. So I thought, okay, it'd be kind of nice to kind of prepare ourselves in our mentality and then just anticipate, okay, look, what can God do with us? And then actually see, okay, what, what should we be expecting? What should we be looking for with regard to this, you know, to God doing? And what, what is it? What is, what is revival, you know? All right, so according to Merriam-Webster de, uh, definition, uh, dictionary, uh, revival is one, an act or instance of reviving, okay? A state of being revived such as renewed attention or interest in something, A or B, a uh, new presentation or publication of something old, or C, a period of, <laughs> of renewed religious interest and often uh, highly emotional evangelistic uh, meeting or series of meetings, or two, a uh, restoration of force validity or effect as to a contract. Okay, um, so act of or instance of reviving or being revived. Okay, so the idea of revive, technically it's a compound word, Re would be the prefix to five. Five, the idea is just life, so renewing of life. You bring to new, again, life. Uh, the word itself is not found in scripture as far as just revival, but it's found in the, as far as in English, if you, if you look in uh, your scripture, um, you're gonna find it in the form of revive, um, and then that is found seven times in Scripture. Uh, there's just seven instances of that word itself just revive in Scripture. Um, but the Hebrew word from which it comes, um, the word haya, that is found a number of times. That is actually found let's see, 235 times in Scripture itself. Not just as in... Um, Revive, but in the various forms uh, that that word is used, or that that word is used, but it still has the same definition, and that is to live, have life, remain alive, sustain life, live prosperously, live forever, be quickened, or be made alive, uh, be restored to health or to life. And then here are the different ways that it's translated uh, that Hebrew word beyond just where the seventh instance is where it's used as revive. Uh, it's 150 times uh, translated as live, or uh, 34 times as alive, 
save, or as in rescue, is uh, 13 times quicken, which again, the idea is, you know, make alive. 14 times revive. Well, it's listed as 12 times, but I actually counted seven uh, on, in this reference here. Uh, surely, 10 times life, nine times recover, eight times, and then there's nine other miscellaneous uses of it um, that are related here. But again, the, uh, the idea of it is just be made alive, come to life. Um, all right. The outline that we would follow with regard to the series is going to look something along the lines of go here. Uh, this it's kind of roughly like a five-step process now granted this is I wouldn't say this is like prescriptive but this is something that is a general observation uh, now this this is coming from brother Van Gelderen's book but as far as this would be the general observation as far as like what would follow in a period of what would be considered revival now granted there is instances of you would have corporate which would be like organizational or in other words like a group and then there's also like personal, but it still would follow the same pattern. Um, and usually personal precedes obviously corporate. So you need stirring in your heart. You find yourself where you're lacking. You find yourself where you're deficient spiritually. You go to seek God. Boom. Okay. And then, you know, he meets with you. You are revived. You're restored. You're renewed again. Into, uh, not that you lost eternal life, but rather that you are restored in your relationship, your fellowship. You're drawn closer to him now where you're walking close whereas before you wouldn't have been. And then, uh, but the, the general pattern would follow is that you come to the realization that, okay, there's got to be something more. There's a dissatisfaction with basically where, where you're at. You come to a realization like, okay, this is not, you know, what life's all about. And so there's like a hungering or a longing for, okay, there's got to be something more. And then what you do at that point is typically the logical response to that would be, okay, the, what is that something more that I'm seeking out? So you start seeking God. You start seeking God's presence. And then, boom, God comes down. And what that is is that he would meet with you. He's going to point out things. And then the fourth would be brokenness, which is the pathway to blessing, okay, which that would be that God points out something in your life, <laughs> kind of like we saw in James that he points out, okay, you're adulterers and adulteresses. You know, know you not the friendship with the world is enmity with God. And it's like, okay, this is what's been breaking or hindering or causing that barrier between me being close, causing for me to long where there's a distance. And so he points out what that is. And typically at that point, you have one of two choices to respond. The logical one would be obviously the break. What I mean by that is he points out something that is wrong. You can agree with him <laughs> and take care of that. Or, or like a lot of people tend to do, and which, which is human nature, is that you can get mad and just, ah, whatever, you know, disregard that, and go about your way or whatever. But logically, it just makes sense. Okay, hey, you break, and then after that, it's basically life anew or life restored. Now you got, you got, after you've got the brokenness, in other words, you got that obstacle removed because you've broken, you submitted, then you move forward into basically God's. God's blessing. In other words, now you're meeting God. Now you're walking, you're walking closer with God as, as before. All right. So that is in a nutshell going to be basically where we're going to be looking at the next five weeks. Well, six, I think technically, because next week we're going to be looking at the end of their series. But we're going to look at each phase of it, and then scripturally, as far as what what that entails. And then, okay, what, how does that apply to us? Um, back to James. Now, a reason why I started here, there's a number of other portions that we can look at. We can look at it first, John, where we're told that uh, we're not to love, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Uh, for if any man love the world, you know, the love of the Father is not in him. For the things that are in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, you know, are basically, they're not of the Lord. And so they're against him. And those would be barriers. Those are things that would cause uh, hindrance for our drawing nigh to God. And then also, what I was wanting to look at is in Revelation 3, 
were God's rebuke to the church at Laodicea in that he told them that you're neither hot nor cold, but you're lukewarm. And as a result, he's going to spew them out of his mouth, or he desired to spew them out of his mouth. But he gives remedy to them in verse 19, and that he says, Be zealous, therefore repent. And then the reason why is because, you know, whom I love, I chasten. Uh, so, you know, when we were rebuked, when we're, something's called the attention to it in our lives, uh, there's hope. <laughs> That's a good thing. You don't usually think of it as such, but it is. It's a good thing because then the thing is, if God really wasn't interested or if there wasn't any hope, then why would he bring it to your attention to begin with? Things are brought to your attention so that you can remedy them and take care of them, right? Uh, if there wasn't, you'd be taken out. I mean, it's just a matter of fact. I mean, I just even on a human level, when you get fired, do you usually have uh, pre-notice or forward notice? In other words, <clears throat> I've, I've never worked I mean there could be there could be an exception but I've never worked be it in a professional uh, company or even the unprofessional ones where they usually give you advance notice or advance warning to you being fired you usually if there's an issue and the employer still wants to deal with you like in order they, they have hope to you know keep you on then they give you like a written warning or something like that, either verbal warning, written warning, and that obviously that's all documented. But the thing is, they would approach you, you know, and they would tell you, look, okay, listen, you need to fix, you need to fix this. They may not always do it in a pleasant manner, but they at least do that. They give you that courtesy, you know, before they just up and let you go. Usually, most places, <laughs> at least I know where I work in my in my, uh, my environment, um, we're called. So that we can be like, I guess, damage control in case somebody goes wild. But usually they, they just have us there ready to escort the person out. They just call a person in the office, usually at a time that would be with less people around. And they just tell them, hey, you're gone. Get out of here. Don't come back. If you come back, we're going to have to call the cops and you're going to have to get arrested. So we give them a trespass warning. All right, that's... <laughs> that's <laughs> I've worked in one place where they had us do that, come up, and then... They don't even get a chance to empty out their own desk. The supervisor does that for them. We just come up and then we gotta make sure that we have the following amount in case they go wild or something like that. We try to get physical with somebody. But anyway, well, the point with that is, is that they usually don't give you advance notice with regard to letting you go. They just wanna let you go. So you get rebuked, there's hope. And the reason for that is because there's opportunity to be able to remedy that situation and get right. All right, back to James. Draw an eye to God, and he will draw an eye to you. Right? Revival, I know it's kind of a broad subject, but the fact is it's dealing with the fact that we are at some point in our walk distant from God, or we find ourselves distant, we feel ourselves distant, we, see, we feel ourselves as to be with some sort of obstacle to either feeling God's presence actively and granted, I, don't, I do know that we walk by faith and not by sight. Uh, two, or as to maybe answers to prayer, or just something where it seems like, okay, there's, there's, there's a longing for something beyond just, okay, what I'm already have, or what I'm already experiencing. And that's not uh, seeking to be greedy, but rather you have a longing or a desire for a closeness and a fellowship uh, that really should be common. Uh, that God desires for us. And so um, we have that quite often. It's because it's not that God distances himself, but rather it's we end up straining. We veer off. We twist off from the path. We take a step here, a step in that direction. Uh, we let ourselves get distracted or weighed down by the cares of this world. And so we need to come back into line rather to be refocused on that which is vital, which that, and, and that which is important. So, James, at this point in his address to, um, he was he was writing to the Jewish believers. He's writing to the twelve tribes, which are scattered, but basically it's to believers, and by extension, it's to us. And at this point, his address to them is that, or really to us, he starts just saying, okay. 
where do you get animosities and tensions and where do you get the wars and fightings? Is it not from the lust of your flesh? And then you ask and then you receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. Verse 4, adulterers and adulteresses, uh, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God, and whosoever uh, therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now question, is he saying there <laughs> that uh, you can't have Christian or non-Christian friends? No. Okay. So what, what exactly does it mean that being a friend of the world is being an enemy with God? Like, what's that friendship? In particular, then what's that look like? Well, it's just the world. An allegiance to the world. Or, you know, uh, the world system. Okay. Anybody else? Are you like them? Um. When when you get the mind of Christ, you think completely different than the world does. But we're not to go all together out of the world. So, yeah, it would be the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. In other words, the, the reason for living. If you if you pick up a worldly philosophy of what life is about, and you love that, you know, whether it's Epicurean or Stoic or, you know, and that becomes your love. It's not the person and what they love. So in other words, we can, love, we can be friends with the people, but we can't love what they love. We're different. Amen. Yeah, basically. Your uh, what he had pointed out, or I guess what Todd pointed out, as far as your allegiance. Um, where's it, I guess where does your loyalty lie? With the Lord, or somebody else, or something else? Is your mentality that which says, okay, what God values is what's paramount to me. Uh, if there's a divergence here, if there's something that's different, if you find yourself where, okay, I'm <laughs> on the wrong side of, of allegiance to God, uh, obviously that would call for repentance, but um, the thing is, Paul put it like this also in uh, Philippians, uh, that uh, that of whom he spoke the even now that he was weeping, uh, that uh, whose uh, glory is in their shame. But in other words, they glory in shameful things. Uh, whose God is their belly. And then uh, summary was that uh, they mind earthly things. So in other words, being, I guess being earthly minded is what he's addressing. And then beyond that, he gives remedy here in verse 6. He says, uh, but he giveth grace... Uh, but he giveth more grace. Uh, and then, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And then submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And then draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Alright, so, if we're in allegiance to other than what God's philosophy, God's mentality is, to God's, to God's plan, to God's cause, um, we're called to, one, humble ourselves, and that is, um, uh, one, repent, okay? Changing your mind, realizing, basically recognizing, okay, what, what I've adopted or what I value or what I esteem is obviously different and then adopt God's attitude and value system towards what that would be. You know, he calls it sin. It's sin. <laughs> Plain and simple. Okay, I'm in the wrong. Lord, help me to do right now from this point forward and then moving forward that I adopt his value system towards that and then uh, I submit myself to him obviously resist the devil uh, and that is basically I'm not out here trying to attack him thinking is I have God's strength and I need God's strength to be able to go ahead and do anything anyways but rather it's I take a military stance against him fighting stance he comes to attack and again, it's not me and my strength. It's as in Ephesians 6, that uh, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And I put on the whole armor of God and I take God's word. And whatever he comes to attack me with, I stand against whatever he's attacking uh, using God's word so that he will flee. And then I draw an eye to God. I, 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 I make the initiative to go ahead and seek 
so that he's got to draw an eye to me. And uh, basically, the more effort I put into that, he's going to draw closer to me. Go to First John. I know we already addressed this one. Uh, verse 15. Uh, 2, I'm sorry. 1 John 2. Then chapter two uh, verse 15. Chapter 2, verse 15. It says, uh, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Uh, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Uh, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And then the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God uh, abideth forever. All right. So, my affections, where they lie, um, do they lie? Uh, we're, we're commanded to set my affections on things above and not on things of this, uh, this earth. And the reason why is because I'm dead and my life is hidden with Christ in God. And these things are passing away. Uh, but that which is of God's will, basically, is everlasting, okay? So this is not going to have any value. Um, it's not to say that you can't have nice things or you know, have a nice, <laughs> I guess, quote-unquote life. Uh, but the fact is, uh, am I prioritizing that which is eternal? Am I prioritizing that which God prioritizes and what he values? Or am I attached to that which is going to be passing away and that is fleeting and is going to basically have an end of destruction? Um, where my treasure is, there will my heart be also, uh, Jesus told in the Sermon on the Mount to his disciples and those that would follow him, that seek to follow him. Um, if my heart and my affections are set on here and now, that's perishing. But rather, set your affection on things above and not on things of this world. The reason why, again, our, our life is hidden in Christ with God. We're dead. God considers us dead. Uh, I know we're walking around, we're breathing, we're talking. You know, we all got up this morning. I don't know how many of y'all ate breakfast, but, you know, later on we're going to go have lunch and then we go <coughs> eat there later, later tonight, go to sleep, and then go do our jobs about this week. But as far as our sin, God considers us dead. We have new nature. If we receive Christ, then we have new nature. We have new life. All right? So our, our, our old man is dead. We're supposed to reckon him as dead so that we can live unto God, be well-pleasing unto him, and that we may prove uh, not only just by having yielded, but also that we may prove that uh, what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Um, so, with being able to um, draw an eye and yielding myself and submitting, I can not only just resist the devil, and then I can only I can not only just uh, return, obviously, unto God, but I can experience his hand of blessing on me, and then we will be in, I guess, what would be considered a, a state of revival, which is having a life on you. And it's not that your life ended, that it's dead, but rather it's, uh, <laughs> it seems redundant, but I was going to say it's revitalized, it's re-energized, whereas your life would have been longing or feeling empty, and you feel like, okay, there's something missing here, what's going on? Rather, you have energized life or re-energized life by being in close proximity and close fellowship and walking closely okay, with the Lord. All right. So that is our introduction. Um, we're going to be looking at, again, the five, and that would be the five... Um, Again, these aren't like prescriptive, but these are just an observation of how the process has played out, not only just in scripturally, but also like historically. We're going to be looking at some as far as uh, historical instances that have happened here in the U.S. and then in parts of Europe and even in Asia where you've seen 
corporate level, not just on an individual level, but like on a corporate level of groups of Christians that have drawn nigh to God. They found themselves in in place where um, they felt themselves distant, where they felt like as if there was a barrier between them and the Lord. So they started out seeking God. God came down. He pointed out things that needed addressed. They broke, submitted unto that, and then they received God's blessing. Now, mind you, even if on a corporate level, folks, I mean, I know this is common sense, but the fact is if even on a corporate level, folks don't respond, the fact is you personally can have revival, you personally can walk close to God, and you can experience God's blessing personally in your life, and you don't have to wait on anybody else to do that or for that to happen in your life. All right? Uh, but we'll be looking at instances of that being the case. So next week it'll be, um, or not next week, but the week after, the following week it'll be, okay, uh, there's got to be something more, and then the seeking God, and then God coming down, and then brokenness, and then after that it's just the, basically life again, and then where we're God's already, where God, we're, we're being blessed from God moving forward. All right. Does anybody have any questions? I know it's kind of a broad subject. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, we're dismissed a little early. Great. Thanks, Charlie. No problem.